Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Lady Scientist Podcast. I'm your host, Jocelyn Pearl, and we have another great interview in store for you guys today. I chat with Kanika Rajan. She's a computational neuroscientist and assistant professor at Mount Sinai in New York, and her lab studies things like how the brain learns and makes decisions. This conversation is one that's going to stick with me for a very long time. I learned so much. I think you guys will learn a lot. Even if there are parts that you are having trouble grasping, I really recommend you hang in there because Kanika has all these great analogies and I just picked up, you know, little bits here and there and thought about it more after the conversation. And I think it will really expand your mind. I will say that. Before we jump into the interview, I just want to give a thanks to all of our listeners and supporters. If you've been enjoying our content so, so far, the easiest way to support the podcast is to subscribe to our YouTube channel or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Also wanted to give a shout out to our patrons, AJ and Fani. Thank you so much for supporting the show. We really appreciate it. Um, this episode is sponsored by Kendall Investor Relations. So for all of our budding biotech entrepreneurs out there, if you are unsure of how to start your conversation with investors, I really recommend you reach out to Carlo and his team. The link is below and they can help you with that process. So thank you also for all your messages and words of encouragement. I really appreciate it. And last announcement before we jump into the interview today is there is a fundraiser walk happening in Seattle, September 12th, and it is to support the Huntington's Disease Society of America. This is an organization that supports patients with Huntington's disease and their families and caregivers, they do a wealth of good. And I highly recommend you check that out if you're in the area or just check out HDSA's website. They have chapters all over the world so you can support them wherever you live. It's been such a crazy year and, oh God, and you know, <laughs> everyone's schedule and all of that. And I know you're on the East coast, so. I am, I am. You are, um, in Seattle. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so um, I don't know. I'll flip my camera around. You can see we have a little oh. view of, of Lake oh. Union here oh. and a lot of the, you know, if you know Fred Hutch and University yeah, of Washington. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. Of yeah. Course. I mean, so. You know, if I didn't live in New York and I could pick anywhere else in the U.S. to live, Seattle would be. Really? Yes, 100%. Like the food is good. The outdoors are beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. And every time I have been, including a failed like Rainier attempt. It's oh, been wow. Gorgeous. It was you big. attempted Rainier. I, we did, yes. And was it weather that you got? I wish, I wish, no. So my husband turned around a day after me and that was weather. I turned around basically like towards the end of the first day. Like okay. I didn't even make it to Camp Muir, in fact. Oh, oh so really? I hadn't trained for the mountain, you see? Yeah. So, I had done, I had climbed Kilimanjaro before and I had run marathons. So I thought, you know, I'm fit. I can do this. It's yeah. Like I mean, Kilimanjaro is way taller than Rainier. <laughs> exactly. I was like, you know, I've done 19,341 feet. This, sh I should be manageable. Oh, ho, ho, ho. That not kicked my ass. So really? Quick. So quick. Like 20 minutes out of the parking lot, you're in a, in a glacier. Right out of the parking lot, it's like a 15 degree slope. And you're carrying your entire pack, which I wasn't prepared to, for, like the fitness. And now I'm I'm seeing, you know, my husband actually train for real for Rainier. And it's, a, I mean, you gotta, I, I'm sorry if I'm wasting your time, but. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. No, I, uh, yeah, I still haven't done Rainier. I've done a few other, you know, I did Helen's, which obviously is nice. the shortest of the volcanoes. Um, nice. And we did Adams last summer. Nice, was, nice, very nice. But then yeah. you had to train specifically for it, right? Like, it, you know, you lift weights. And, you know, he did the thing where he climbed up and down our 50-story building for wow. two and a half hours. Wow. And now he gets to do this this weekend with a pack on his back. And I'm like, yeah, this is not what we did. A few days ago. <laughs> we just kind of fetched up, like with our backpacking yeah. backpacks, right? Like the heavy, big Gregory packs. Mm -hmm. They didn't even tell us. Like, you know, your gear's wrong and you don't look ready to climb. I mean, I had eyeliner on and I'm like, <laughs> we're going to get this done. Wow. I, yeah. 
Wait, yeah. so were you with a guide or you just went? <laughs> we went with Alpine Ascents. Okay. okay. So like a proper guide company. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, you know, we were part of a group. So actually what was, what happened was we were meant to climb much later in the season. Mm -hmm. And then they had an unexpected opening and they were like, oh, we have an opening for two people and the group is just leaving. Can you join us on short notice? And we were like, yeah, sure, whatever. We did. It was some kind of elite team. Like there were these women Sherpanis who had, you know, who were the first women to ascend K2 from Nepal or actually India and Pakistan and Bangladesh and all of South Asia. Yeah. And they were on the team. Uh, there was another guide who had climbed Rainier 149 times, and this was his 150th summit attempt. Oh, my God. And we were like, you know, that should have been our first clue. <laughs> Except we were like, oh, neat man, nice to meet you. And they were all these, you know, alpinists. Like, yeah. you know, when we were waiting for them to debrief us, these were people that were doing, like, downward dog and doing, like, you know, squat jumps on the spot because they were like, we just want to, you know, shake things out a bit. And we were just <laughs> sitting there looking at our cell phones going, doo -doo -doo. we should have known. And we Oh did. my gosh. Yeah, so we just had our asses handed to us. I mean, he stuck it out for a good 24 hours after I did. I bailed. I was like, wow. And in fact, the Sherpani who led me, so they're, you know, there's a professional guide service, so they can't just like let unprepared tourists like me just kind of die. So they have to take us back all the way to the parking lot. This lady yeah. came back all the way to the parking lot, sat me on a bench, and climbed back up to catch up with the rope team. Wow. Same day. And I'm like, yeah, I got nothing. And she hauled my pack down, mind you. So wow. humbling experience. Certainly. Oh my gosh. That is a that's an interesting story. I love that. Big time. So I'm like, okay, if I do this, I've got to do this like train properly. Yeah. I've certainly put myself. My husband could tell you, I have done uh, numerous excursions without training properly. <laughs> you see? And then, you know, it's a really tough thing to do, but then you kind of get through it, right? But this yeah. wasn't like that. This was like, you know, life and death. Like, I remember at some point crying and begging the woman, I just want to sit down for five minutes and close my eyes. Just yeah. for five minutes and like sobbing and saying, I'm so tired. I just need to close my eyes for five minutes. And she kept saying, no, you will die. Like you're, you're hypothermic. If you oh. sit down and close your eyes, you will pass out and you will die. So no, you got to keep going. Oh my gosh. And I was like, okay, this isn't like anything else, right? Anything else like, okay, you shit your pants, you still finish the marathon. <laughs> right? It's not pretty, but you get it done. This was like a whole other level. I was like, altitude is just like a number, clearly, for this one. Yeah. Right? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Anyway. That wow. Wow. So yeah, I think we can just dive right in. And I wanted to mention, um, I, so I just finished reading this book. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it, Nexus, the Nexus series. It's like a sci-fi book um, written by a guy, uh, Ramez Nam from Singularity University. Mm, but it's a lot right. of like, it has a lot of like real neuroscience and oh, coding. Right. That's good to know. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. I'm it was make a note of it. Yeah. Really good. And it kind of got me back into thinking about like the brain and, mm. you know, some of these, um, you know, the crosstalk between like computation and neuroscience and that kind of thing. So I was glad I, I got to like read that before we had a chance okay. to, to chat. Um, so yeah, I think we can just dive right in. Um, sure. I, I just made a note of the book. So, you know, we have. Oh, good. Yeah. I, I recommend it. I've only, it's a series and I only read the first one, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I mean, I loved, he, and he says at the end, you know, a lot of the, even though this is like science fiction and kind of futuristic, um, a lot of the neuroscience is based on like real experiments that have yeah. been done. Um, so some of the ones he references is, are the ones where, um, you know, they basically train a mouse to move like a robotic mm -hmm. arm mm -hmm. or um, some of yeah. these situations where, you know, say someone has lost their arm, they want to be able to use a prosthetic. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was interesting. I didn't, I wasn't aware of some of that research that yeah. has been going on. Do you have any 
thoughts about Any clever thoughts on it so it's not really my field so brain computer yeah. interfaces that are used to rehab people with uh, with these traumatic injuries i mean it's its own field yeah in fact one of my postdocs um is a bci researcher who then decided to do computational stuff for a while oh, but no. i'm pretty sure that you know he's worked on spinal cord injury stuff before he's a mm -hmm. macaque physiologist actually dr matt perrick okay um, and you know, it's it's really his his field, but you know, it's it's one of those subfields of neuroscience that's right. Um, you know, it, it has like hardcore experiments, and it's got hardcore theory also. Yeah. So it's, yeah, a lot what of is... computational neuroscience people go and work in um, in BCI labs actually. Interesting. And vice versa. Yeah, and that was one of my questions because your 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 lab is self described as bridging these kind of different fields and applying a lot of theory mm -hmm. how much how much of your research is connecting like theory to i don't know experimental data actually so um so i'm a theorist i don't do any experiments of my own in my lab okay um, most all of my work is computational however it's grounded in data so you know in my, my phd and you know was more in abstract models um i built models before experimental technologies took over and now we're recording more and more activity from more and more parts of the brain while animals and people are doing various things right so in the face of all of these data, I build neural network models that are constrained by these kinds of data. So I work closely with a network of experimentalists. Um, usually even the process of coming up with a theory is, um, I'm, I'm sparked by some kind of interesting, um, interesting to me, experimental observation. Like somebody has said, oh, wouldn't this be cool? So I look at it and I go, oh, this is a crazy thing that we don't know the hows of or whys of. So what if we built an artificial system that, you know, walked like a duck and quacked like a duck, but then I built this duck. So I'm able to tell you what went into the biological system in cases when you don't have access to the actual duck. So while I would, what I do is, you know, mathematical theories, they are still, you know, motivated by search for general principles and they are grounded in experimental data. So it's really, um, I would say we sit right between neuroscience and, you know, AI ML fields. So that's sort of where the computational neuroscience field sits. I see. And so when you say theory, you're talking about a mathematical theory. That's right. That's can right. You, can you walk us through that process and, and how, how you got started doing this type of work? Sure. So, you know, I came to neuroscience sort of circuitously. Um, I was trained as, um, as an engineer. Um, and, you know, it was only after undergrad, well, actually towards the end of undergrad that, you know, my, uh, my interest was somewhat piqued by, by neuroscience problems. And my original training, you know, is physical sciences, physics, math, engineering, those are the fields. But then, you know, they taught me the tools and techniques that I now apply um, in, in, my, in my research in neuroscience. And so, you know, afterwards, when I wanted to do something, you know, to, to learn more, I couldn't imagine studying anything besides the brain. It's like where we are now is where physics used to be in like 1920s. Um, so it's, you know, it's got this, this feel, right? Like this is the fundamental things about the brain that we don't understand, like how the biological system learns, remembers, decides. Uh, we don't know any of those things. So, you know, um, if, you, if you're sitting next to someone like, you know, at a party or on a bus or a train in the before times, um, they would ask you something like what you did. And then you said, if you were a neuroscientist, they'd say, oh, you know, do you know anything about the dream? How do we dream? Or what happens in, you know, X, Y, Z disease? Or, you know, where's consciousness coming from? And we have no answers to any of these at sort of any level besides the superficial or philosophical. Um, and so I, I can't imagine anything else that I would be doing. So I took those tools and techniques and I turned it to this problem, is how does the biological brain learn, remember, decide? And you know, if I'm lucky, make inferences about what could happen in, in pathological situations. I see. So, so learn remember decide those seems like seem like your themes kind of of your research have you moved the needle at all in our understanding of of those types of brain behaviors 
I think somewhat. So I can give you a more concrete um, answer to this in a second as I walk you through how we do one of sure. um, to understand one of these models of let's say memory. Um, but in your question is sort of this deeper one also, right? Which is what would the finished product look like? And I think when the field first started, it was formed by, you know, lapsed physicists and engineers. There was no computational neuroscience until physicists decided they wanted to study the biological problem, right? Except physicists have a certain way of thinking. And I did too, right? We clear the deck and we find a simple sliver of the problem and we write down something that looks like a unifying theory, right? A theory that should apply even if the little details are changed. Like if I write a theory of how a mouse remembers, then it should hold whether you look at human memory or mouse memory or robotic memory or literally anything. That's what you know, unifying theory should look like. In my experience and what I'm increasingly starting to believe, and I realize belief is a weird word for scientists to use, is that there may not be one for the biological brain. Um, there isn't gonna be a unifying theory. So there isn't going to be a simple answer to how does the brain learn, remember, and decide is really what I'm getting to. Instead- which seems, Sorry, which seems intuitive, right? In a way, right? Right. So what is probably going to happen is people like me and people like experimentalists, it will take heavy lifting from us both. And what we'll end up doing is build a pile of models. I think that's what will happen, that there's going to be integrative theories of learning, remembering and deciding. And collectively, we may get some understanding about how these processes unfold. So I can give you a more concrete example of, of one of these. Uh, one of these things, right? Um, so the dominant model of memory used to be um, a, a, a thing called fixed points, which is to say that let's say your brain is a bag of neurons and you wanted to remember two things, right? Like you wanted to talk to me at five o'clock and you wanted to be done at six o'clock. Um, so the dominant model of how the biological brain would remember those two things is it would take a group of neurons over here and neurons fire, you know, electrical pulses at certain intervals and with a certain frequency. So you would take a pile of neurons over here and you would make them all fire at a certain fixed firing rate or frequency of emitting these electrical spikes and you would keep that number the same. Then you would go over here, pick another pile of numbers, another pile of uh, neurons and elevate their firing rate to some constant level. This thing would be memory one and the other thing would be memory two. That used to be the dominant model. And it turned out, and, you know, and this was done, and this was shown in experimental systems by a lot of experimentalists and so forth. Then, became, then came the technological advances that allowed experimentalists to measure while animals were doing something interesting. So this fixed point model was validated using animals that were not doing a whole lot of very interesting things, right? They were just either making only a saccadic eye movement, um, but nothing else was moving. But then people started to record electrical activity from you know, mice and macaques and humans and a variety of other species, including larval zebrafish, while animals were performing much more complicated things. So let's say you know, a mouse is running around a, on a ball, it's running down a corridor and trying to figure out moment by moment, should I be going left, should I be going right, the kinds of decisions that we make in terms of working memory, right? Like, you know, if I'm standing in front of the elevator or walking towards the elevator, am I going to go into this bank or the other bank? Those kinds of decisions and people were mimicking those in experimental settings. And pretty soon these fixed points vanished. Instead, what they saw was there's a whole, you know, this entire bag of neurons lit up, except it lit up in a very specific way. It looked as though there was a wave of activity that flew through, that flowed through this bag of neurons. Each neuron made like one bump of activity a small amount of time and then shut up. But collectively over the entire population, it looked as though there was a wave. The wave was as long as the duration you want to maintain in working memory. And this was, you know, this was, this has been seen in multiple nervous systems. This has been seen in different brain areas that have ostensibly nothing to do with memory. This has been seen in different brain areas that have vastly different underlying anatomies. 
anywhere from regions that you may have heard the names of, like the hippocampus, like the parietal area, like various parts of the frontal cortices, like subcortical areas, like the striatum. People have seen these waves. Mm -hmm. Fixed points went away, but in a very similar task, you replace them by these things that are now known as neural sequences. Interesting. So what people like me do is take a step back, we look at the evolution of this field, and we say, why stop there? When behaviors went from restricted to more naturalistic, the same sort of functionality, namely working memory, went from something kind of simple, fixed points, right, the static non-changing persistent activity to something that moved a little, looked like sequences. If you look at a single sequential neuron, it just looks like it's making a bump. It's uninterpretable. So to really understand that, you have to look at the whole population. Experiments allowed you to do that and models knew how to explain. So people like me go, well, why stop there? Maybe in, you know, people like us, while I'm chewing gum and buttoning my shirt, while I'm thinking about which elevator bank to go to, that kind of working memory, it may not be mediated either by fi fixed points or sequences, maybe something more complex, like very complicated, irregular activity that is still deterministic, but it would look kind of irregular if you just looked at it. So how do all of these kind of tie together in, a, in one of the many theories of the brain that you have? Maybe what you need as a fundamental unit of working memory depends on how complex the thing is that you want to do with said memory. And the more complex the thing is that you want to do with this working memory, the more complex the representation ought to be. But now you see what I've done with this story that I just told you, I've made a prediction. So now I go and tell the story to an experimental colleague who will say, oh yeah, I have these monkeys and monkeys can do crazy complex cognitive tasks while they're awake, while they're behaving, they're moving joysticks, they're you know, doing these amazing tasks. And this person can verify or falsify my theory. So that's sort of the process of how one of these things comes about. I see. And so in the case of the monkey example, the types of data that you would then collect, is it, you know, these types of neuronal patterns across the brain or, or what's the full scope of like what you're looking at? So um, the, you mean you're asking about the types of data that can constrain these types of models? Yeah. Um, across, I mean, I can answer this question across um, multiple levels, which is to, exp you know, which is going to be kind of a theme, I think, in our <laughs> Yeah, so, it's up um, to you. We can keep it high level or we, you know, like I no, mentioned, this is good. I'm, no, interest, I'm interested, but we, you know, I, I understand that our listeners might not have the same, same background. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I get it. So yeah, you can, you know, splice it the, the way that you want or make me more narrow or you can tell me as, as I keep going. Sure. So um, I think like, you know, before my time in neuroscience, people were, you know, sticking one electrode at a time in an animal's brain. And then they were kind of eyeballing that neuron while something very specific was being shown to this animal. Then came these advances in neuroscience that allowed people to put many of these wires together down on the surface of the brain and record electrical activity, not just from one neuron, but everyone around this neuron. So groups of neurons suddenly came in. And people found that what looked like kind of noise in the context of a single neuron, now in the context of this bigger population or ensemble-wide activity, suddenly had a different meaning. So, you know, like the wave thing I told you, right? If I were recording just one neuron at a time, I will just say, oh, it just made a bump at like, I don't know, five seconds, and that was the end of that. But now, if I'm looking at the whole population in some brain region, all of a sudden, everyone's going beep, 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 beep as long as the relevant duration of the trial. Very soon you have a very different picture in mind for what is the fundamental unit that is doing this task, right? So it went from a neuron to now a population. Now we're at the second revolution, like one more step away from this one, which is multiple regions. So people are recording activity from many, many neurons across multiple interacting brain regions, sometimes brain-wide. So I have this like long-term collaboration with someone that um, records electrical activity from you know anywhere from 40 to 100,000 neurons, which is the size of the whole brain of larval zebrafish. And this is um, in Carl Dezroth's lab. 
So they can literally monitor the electrical activity for a very long time of every neuron in this behaving animal, which wow. is amazing. <laughs> So now, not only can I ask this, you know, how did this wave go through in this one region, I can suddenly say, well, I'm looking at this wave, did this wave come from within this region, or did it originate somewhere else that was connected to this region? And then within the context of the whole brain, what are these other regions doing? So we're at that level, right? Now, you know, we're asking questions at the level of interactions between neurons within areas as well as across areas. So electrical activity, just neural activity has grown in this axis. Simultaneously, you know, and just as you and I are living in these hypersensed environments, right? Like, you know, there's cameras everywhere in New York City. So behavior is also monitored long-term. So people are now able to record, you know, actual monitor or, you know, videos of animals in different lab settings. And sometimes over very long periods of time, including, let's say it's a baby animal learning something through imitation from one of its parents in a cage to somebody like, somebody like me learning to play an instrument, for example. Behavior data, as in, you know, how the body moves and what kind of readouts behaviors give, that's also being monitored over very long time. So that's another sort of rich data set, right? There's long-term monitoring of behavior and long-term monitoring of the electrical activity that caused the behavior in the first place. So we're now poised to create theories that are grounded in these kinds of data. So just looking at the measurements alone, you don't know much because it's just, it's just patterns, right? And these patterns are high dimensional, they're complex. You can't even visualize all of it, much less understand what the essential features are and how to draw the arrow between this neural dimension and the behavioral dimension and what influences what and those kinds of things, you need mathematical models to pull out essential features. So models have to have the relevant complexity to be able to do this. And those advances have originated in you know, the AI ML world. I mean, that's where the technical innovations have happened, but because our goals as biologists are different, we just, borrow from them, basically, the tools to, um, to adapt our models so that we can extract from these types of data. And these data come from different animals. So small nervous sure. systems to large nervous systems. And the scale is quite different, but we're able to make connections even though they're different types? Yes, we are. So um, when you say types, there's sort of, you know, you can ask the question of, again, like based on different species, right? So if you go from something like, you know, larval zebrafish, where you can monitor the whole brain, it's got 100,000 neurons, to mouse, which has got, you know, a billion neurons plus, and you're only monitoring a few thousand at a time. So then the number of unobserved neurons to the number of observed neurons is, is a big number. And then you go to macaques, and then you go to the human brain, that, you know, what we call the sampling problem becomes more and more severe. However, what mathem mathematical models can do, and this is where there's a little difference between the way somebody like me would, as a biologist, would tackle this problem and somebody that's a more a machine learning person would tackle this problem. What I would do is to say, even with limited data, can we understand something that you couldn't get at from measurements alone? And I've done that in many of my papers and that's right also. If I were a machine learning person, what I would want to do is to now with computing advances, you can build in the actual sampling ratio. So you can build a billion neuron network and sample from it or 10 billion neuron network and sample from it 0.0001% and say, this is the observed number. What can we do? Um, what can we do with it? But yes, you can make progress even in the face of this. But the differences in approaches between yourself and a machine learning person, your flavor of analyzing this data comes down to neural networks. Is that correct? That's right. And is it like, is it primarily that or are there other approaches that you apply? So um, I apply a variety of approaches. So neural networks is one of the things that has you know, gained the most, uh, most attention. Um, 
And so, um, I mean, you asked sort of two questions in one here, right? You asked about this AI biology kind of divide a little bit, and you also asked about uh, where neural networks fit in the scheme. Um, and then you also asked about, you know, the other tools that I may be applying in the in the lab, right? Um, so, I mean, in, I, let me answer them in like the reverse order now. So in my research, right, I've looked at abstracted models. Um, for example, I've used tools from statistical physics and mathematics, like random matrix theory, and tried to figure out properties of um, general classes of, of models that may work for things like the brain. Uh, now I work more with time varying dynamics. So like all of the, so I fundamentally think that cognition is dynamic, right? Everything that I'm doing right now, everything I'm thinking about unfolds over time. And so we can't leave the dynamics part out of networks or out of models that match things like the brain. So the fundamental feature of the brain is this time varying activity. The fundamental aspect of behavior is the fact that it's evolving and changing over time. The fundamental aspect of learning, remembering and deciding even at the meta levels are the things that change over time. So the dynamics are key. And if dynamics are key, then neural network models can give you that. And with, with sort of more general classes of connectivity, like if you have connections going between active neurons forward and backward, you get dynamics essentially for free just by the properties of these types of models. So neural networks have become more and more my go-to. Um, and you know, there's other classes of models where this dynamic, other classes of network models where this dynamics is less important. So for example, object recognition and people have done beautiful work on it. Like if I were to, you know, you know, an octopus looking at a crab, if, if it has to recognize very quickly that such a thing is a crab, then something that's a layered architecture with no dynamics in it, like a deep learning network, that works perfectly fine. That's a valid model of this type of behavior in this stream of the visual pathway. But if you know the octopus has to figure out if this is a crab versus not a crab from the pile strewn before it, if it has to think about, okay, if it's a, a crab that's partly occluded, is it a crab that's moving? Or if it has to go off and have a dream about crabs, then those things require timing. And timing comes from feed forward and feedback connections. And so those are the types of networks that I care about the most. And this brings me to really your deeper point of why are there these kinds of divisions, right? So, um, so as I said, you, you know, even previously, like, you know, my tools do come from, they're inspired by, they're adapted from, initially they were invented by the, the AI ML folk, uh, but I use them for a slightly different purpose and computational neuroscientists generally do like me. Um, and I think the divide comes from the fact that the two fields have a different goal. So people often ask me this, right? Because of the way the lab is named, they ask me like, oh, is it ever gonna be possible to bridge the two and like that? Um, and I think that the goals are different. So the answer is no, we can do better with communicating. Um, and and can, if I can tell you in a second, like why I think the goals are different. So AI ML is, is, an, is an engineering field. Right? The goal there is to do something better than it has been done before with the most efficient way possible, the most optimal way possible and so forth. Right? So for example, if I'm interested in something like, how do we do, how do we chew gum, button my shirt and get into the elevator at the same time? Then what I would wanna do if I were an AI ML person is can I build the smallest machine that can do all of these three things perfectly? like chew every single breath, put on all my buttons without making a mistake and get into the right elevator bank when, um, when queued. I have to do this perfectly and this would be a perfect engineering machine to do. This machine would do these three things perfectly. I'm interested at, in the biology of it. So my goal is to understand how we chew gum, button our shirts and get into the wrong elevator once in a while because I'm chewing gum and buttoning my shirt at the same time. Or given the fact, or said more concretely, given the fact that biology has a certain machinery to work with, it has neurons that fire at a certain time scale, it has synapses that are biological, given the constraints of the machinery of biology and the fact that we don't do a lot of things perfectly, 
how does the biological system do it? So the questions are different. The goals are different. The tools may have some commonality, right? Because we are building these network models that were developed primarily for the ML community. But what I'm using them for is to, to discover mechanisms in the biological system that apply there with the, knowing the fact that biology is normal. So even, you know, warts and all, I want to understand the duck. So it's more about observation than engineering and therefore the philosophical motivations of the two fields are inherently different. Yeah, I think more than observation, it's understanding. And I mean, if you were to have this conversation with an ML person, they would say that the building of the machine gives them understanding. I don't think that that's true. Just, you know, it's a taste in problems kind of thing. I think that understanding comes from something that has to go beyond the details of one observation. That has to extrapolate beyond the details of one particular experiment, let's say. Or even can I extract from data something that the experimentalist could not have gotten without the, the mathematical underpinnings. So it's really more like a mechanistic, I want to understand how given the machinery and the limitations of the biological system, the biological system does what it does. You want to be able to observe the complexity, the imperfections, all of it. That's right. And the engineer wants to design something that's simply capable of, you know, executing on a X number of tasks. That's right. That's right. That's Interesting. Exactly right. Huh. I had not, I have not heard that perspective before. I, I, I just, you know, I worked in computational neuroscience for my PhD and, you know, applied some of these models, but not, not a lot of neural networks. I did more, um, you know, linear regression and that kind of thing to understand um, gene expression changes in the brain over time. Um, oh, right. in order to understand things like Huntington's disease or, or bipolar disorder, right. um, which, you know, I think from, it's interesting from a gene level, but I, I do feel like what you're doing with, you know, um, neurons firing in the brain, it, it just seems so much more tangible as a like data resource in a way and how, how we, these need, we need both, frankly. I mean, I think we need all of these levels of abstraction, including the gene expression level and the molecular mechanisms. My models don't speak to those at all. And I think, you know, I, I, I wouldn't even know where to. So, you know, we have to kind of pick a level of abstraction that our tools are good for, and then say, okay, I understand given this level that I understand maybe something that we didn't know before. But yeah, I mean, the, the kinds of models you were talking about are, Actually, honestly, the kinds of models you're talking about may lead themselves to therapies much easier than the kinds of models I can. Interesting. But that said, right, like computational neuroscience and the disease side of computational neuroscience is still a little uh, lacking in the thrusts, right? It's, 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 a, it's really, there's a lot of open problems in that arena. Yeah, absolutely. And your lab works a little bit on that, doesn't it? Yeah. Can you, can you share? what you guys have focused on? Sure, so um, so this is in the context of the larval zebrafish system, but you know it's the same sort of uh, phenomenology that's been observed in many different nervous systems. So it's, it's in the context of uh, major depressive disease. And so one of, the, one of the phenotypes, something that is a very complex disease, and so I say this with a large, lot of caution and humility, is this phenomenon of learned helplessness. So animals, when animal models of, of this kind of disease, um, they're exposed to persistent and inescapable stress, like a chronically challenging situation, um, they have essentially two different behaviors. So initially when the stresses come on, animals will thrash violently against them, right? They will wanna get away from this. They will wanna, you know, there's a vigorous evasive response. But let's say the stress didn't go away because of the way the experiment is designed or because you're trying to understand the effects of persistent inescapable stress or they couldn't get away for whatever reason, eventually animals will lapse into um, a state known as passive coping or learned helplessness where they would not struggle anymore, where the movement ceases basically. 
Um, I mean, you can just imagine a scenario in which a major depression, a person suffering from major depression is kind of curled up into a ball and is not getting out of bed because it, it, everything seems like it's persistent, insurmountable stress. So this is the kind of phenomenon that I study. Um, it occurs in, you know, in various different nervous systems, um, mammalian systems primarily, like a lot of work has happened in rodents. Um, Carl Dyserot's lab, uh, you know, basically figured out a way to mimic this kind of behavior in larval zebrafish. So larval zebrafish have enormous amounts of access. You, so you can see right through them. You can image um, electrical activity brain wide while the animal is being subjected to this kind of challenge paradigm. So when the shocks, like, like for example, mild electrical shocks given to this animal, right? Um, when the shocks first come on, the animal whips its tail vigorously trying to get away, except it's you know, fixed in position so as to be able to image its brain. So it can get away. And the experiment is designed to test the effect of such a persistent challenge, right? So about a half hour into this kind of challenging experience, fish will refuse to swim. Like they go into the state where they're not whipping their tails anymore. They're like, okay, not swimming anymore, passive coping. So they go into this state. Um, so while we're lucky to have this kind of data, right? Well, we're monitoring the behavior over time and we're monitoring the electrical activity brain-wide over time, how these pieces bring this kind of behavior about is still not known. It's, uh, we know that there are a few regions or nuclei involved, but we don't know exactly how this comes about. So what mathematical models are able to do is to draw those arrows, right? They can tell you which neurons inside the brain light up first. What do they do in response to different, uh, you know, epochs of the stress? How are they related to the animal first actively coping by vigorous responding to the, to the stress and then later going into the state where it doesn't matter whether the stress is on or off, the animal's just kind of given up, right? So how those arrows are connected comes from the model. And so what, so some of the work, you know, in, influenced the construction, some of the previous work done in mice and rats has influenced how we constructed these models. Um, but, you know, when a paper that came out in Cell um, a couple of years ago, and we're working on a, on a, on a follow-up of it, we built these models, literally constrained by the data collected in our colleagues' labs. So we built a brain scale model of the fish where every unit in this model was, was trained to produce activity exactly similar to what was recorded um, experimentally. Wow. Right? And so we built this artificial model, except the fact that we built this duck meant we knew how, you know, what the pieces um, that went into it were. I see. And so, so the model we, connects yeah. the dots. The, the model um, is telling us the regions that are important, how they're communicating. That's right. Exactly. So what are the inter-area communication mechanisms that, you know, taken at the whole brain level in the intact behaving animal, influence this kind of behavioral state transition from initially like vigorously actively coping to the stress to eventually essentially giving up in this hopelessness kind of state where there's no more struggle against the behavior anymore. Um, and are so- you, Are you able to reverse engineer the behavior at all? Like, are you able to like override that response in the zebrafish? That's an excellent question. And so uh, to some extent, so what we are hoping to have happen is that we'll discover these essential features, right? Like, as you said, like here are the three key signatures at the neural level that led the animal to, um, to become, you know, learn helpless. And then what we would want to have happen is to change those motifs and show that the behavior either reversed or the other way. We haven't quite gotten to that point yet. But what we do have instead, because the experimentalists are so far ahead of us yet, um, still in, in compared to the theory piece, is that you know they have exposed these fish to ketamine. So if you expose these fish to ketamine, and they have done the exact same experiment on fish that have been given ketamine, and in those fish, the signatures that we have discovered do seem to be reversed. So the the ketamine exposed fish resemble. The, the fish that have never had this challenge experience or the baseline period much closer than the fish that were repeatedly subject to this, uh, to this, to this challenge. 
And so, you know, I could I could treat this as a treat this as a prediction, but it's it's not the error didn't go quite that way yet. But yes, we are able to reverse engineer these models. I think that is the biggest strength of these models. Interesting. So, so one of the questions I wanted to ask you because I think what we're getting at a little bit here is that our understanding of these complex processes are limited by things like the technology that we have available to us and I imagine our computing power. So if you could design an ideal experiment to get at one of these questions, you know, what, what would you need and how would you do it? And what, you know, what would you be trying to answer? Um. So this is so, and this could be influenced by the fact that it's something that I've been thinking about quite a bit in the lab um, recently. It's, you know, um, we build these models of the animal perfectly having learned to do something, right? And this comes from also observing my dog. So I have a dog uh, uh, whom I love dearly. Um, and, you know, over, you know, in the, in the years that we've, we've uh, been fortunate to, to share time with her, we have, you know, tried to teach her a thing or two. Um, and to, to varying degrees of success, um, I should say quite honestly. And then it, it starts to make me think about things like, well, we're training these animals in different labs to do different tasks that we think are important to understanding, you know, key behaviors like learning, remembering, and deciding, as you said, it's, it's sort of a theme here, right? So um, how these animals are actually shaped. So there's this, there are protocols that different labs use to train animals. Um, and it comes from, um, from a lot of history in, in um, psychology and psychophysics called shaping. So animals' behaviors are shaped by means of different kinds of reinforcement, rewards, sometimes punishments. And they're shaped by increasing complexity of the tasks that they learn slowly until they learn the desired task that is relevant for the experiment list. Um, and it occurs in nature as well, right? Like animals learn to either, I don't know, sing a song by imitating their parents' song. Like if it's, if it's a song word, right? They will just have this teacher's song that they have to learn by imitation. That goes through some other kind of shaping procedure. So now imagine that my dog and a dog from Seattle walk into the bar and they both say they can juggle, right? They both juggle and the bartender says, show us and he shows them, right? The, both dogs are able to, able to juggle balls. And then you go, well, how do you know which dog learned by what kind of learning algorithm? Can you tell if one dog learned from, learned from a lab in New York and another one from Seattle? Um, and that's where this concept called curriculum learning comes in. I'm not the one to have invented it. In fact, again, it was, it was um, figured out by machine learning people because they wanted to see how could they train these artificial agents to perform tasks of more complexity than if they were to just teach a naive dog juggling. So curriculum learning is actually a, an artificial mimic or model for how shaping could work. And so that means that by looking at various shaping protocols, if these dogs told you their training history, you might be able to deduce if one dog learned by you know, a reward-based method, another one learned by watching you juggle. Would you be able to tell the difference between the learning trajectories of these two dogs? And if, if the models that we're building are right, and so in fact, what we're now able to do is to um, train neural network models um, to perform tasks. And while we're training them, we ratchet up the complexity of the kinds of tasks that they can do. So not only can they perform multiple tasks, they also learn much more complex tasks than if they were to just start juggling the ball. So in that sense, that's sort of our big result. Now what we want to have, what we want to convince experimentalists to do, and there isn't a whole lot of data for this because, you know, I don't know why there isn't, but there isn't. What we want experimentalist colleagues to do is to be able to keep, collect, and publish their shaping data. So we want all our colleagues to say, you know, if you're training a thousand rats or a thousand mice to do your task, keep the data, the behavioral data, and if we're lucky, the neural data from animals that learned and animals that didn't learn. So that's what my ideal experiment would look like, is for me to write down a theory of what makes a good curriculum and what doesn't, and for experimentalists to be able to tell me if, you know, if, if I'm right. Um, 
that you know this is how a dog learns to juggle and you can teach any dog to juggle if you can find the right curriculum for it i mean you can imagine this having like all kinds of implications right um, anywhere from you know the the small sliver of the brain problem that i care about is like how the dog learned to juggle um, which mine doesn't just by the way, just it's an abstract example of what I wish she did. She's very, very smart, but juggling, not her forte. To all the way to designing curricula for educational purposes, right? As a professor, I care about this. Um, can we design curricula that are individualized um, in a better way than they, they are currently? So, so yeah, my, my perfect set of experiments would be where people keep, collect, and publish their shaping data. <laughs> and that data just there just isn't a lot of it and and for whatever reason it gets thrown away or yeah so it's a it's a mix of different things that i've pieced together um and i, and I want to state this carefully so as not to you know i mean it's it's just the it's a history in the field right different right. labs do them differently uh -huh. a lot of the shaping so first of all there's a technical reason a lot of the shaping just involves getting animals to behave to get used to being handled by somebody, get used to sitting in a chair or standing on a ball and not veg out, just attend to the task. So all that piece is not really interesting to me, right? So that's where the first set of throwing away starts to happen. Then there's the piece about, you know, different labs do things differently, right? Like, you know, postdocs come into the lab and they say, oh, they want to understand how you do X task. Like, how do you pick which elevator bank to get into? Uh, then they'll try a bunch of things um, and until, you know, one animal learns. Then they go, aha, that must be how I should do it. And then they just do it. And then sometimes they'll keep some of these data that make it into method sections of the papers. But the other 10 animals that didn't learn the elevator problem don't, are not, the data are not kept. So what were their failure modes, right? Did they just not attend to it or did you not design the right curriculum for them? That stuff, uh, you know, there are other reasons like just the eco economics of it, right? Really to understand the two dogs walking into the bar problem. You want cohorts of animals, right? You want, you know, two cohorts to be sent to Seattle and two cohorts being sent to New York. And then, and then those two cohorts are trained by different curricula. And then you compare between groups and figure out which dog belonged to which cohort. And that is an expensive proposition. And it's a time consuming proposition. But what is not a problem is the technology to be able to keep and store these data. Now, it used to be, now we're at the position where we can. And so what we wanna do is use this as a chance to, to get the theory ahead of the experiments, which it hasn't been for a while now. And to say, this is why, this is a theoretical result. The math says, this is how you tell the two dogs apart. And what I want experimentalists to do is then say, aha, now I must either falsify this or verify this and start keeping those data. Interesting. Okay, I have a naive question. Um, so we, we've talked a lot about animal models for you know, these types of behaviors, learning, movement. Um, is there, other than the the video style of data collection you mentioned are there ways to look at people for this information or is it still you know it's just too invasive or you know the approach for collecting the data isn't really um something we can do in in humans so there's a lot of human data and, and this is you know it's something that i've only just started to scratch the surface of um, and, you know, off the top of my head, I can name three rock star women um, neuroscientists, uh, Teresa Desrochers at Brown, uh, Nanthia Suthana at UCLA, um, and Danielle Bassett at University of Pennsylvania. Those are three rock star women that work with, uh, work with human data and human imaging data, human EEG data. And they do these, you know, high quality, extremely well designed experiments. Um, and so, you know, those people have collected those data and Danny is a theorist who's analyzed um, these, these um, analyzed different kinds of models based off of these types of data. I've only started to dip my little toe into it very gently. 
And because of the kinds of models that I've built in my past, the only kinds of data that I could easily apply came from invasive experiments in very sick people. So, you know, one of the papers that we have um, is done in collaboration with Uli Rutis Hauser, and he collects data from, uh, from you know, epileptic patients that have these intracranial electrodes that are implanted in their heads, and they do these kinds of memory and recall tasks. They had a high profile science paper come out last year. But those are actual electrical activity within the, from the actual brain, right? And those patients are often, you know, have these diseases and they're in these hospital settings. So that's one source of human data. Now, all of this electrical activity is sitting inside this giant capacitive box. So healthy people, you can't get this kind of data from, but what you can get from healthy people is imaging and EEG data. And so there's no reason why models like mine, recurrent neural network models that are constrained directly by data, cannot be extended to human data of any kind, of the intracranial variety or the imaging kind of experiments. And I'm actually hoping to initiate conversations with these, uh, with these rock star ladies and say, see if we can maybe crack this problem. We'll at least apply these types of models to human um, imaging data. And you know, the biggest advantage of human data is, well, first of all, like, you know, it's, um, it, it's people, we have an innate curiosity about how we do certain things. Uh, we self-report, right? We tell you. So if, I, if you did the, the problem while in the scanner, right? The elevator doors opened and you did this and somebody scanned your brain, there's no guesswork, right? The dogs are still juggling the ball, but they're not telling you how they learned and where they learned it. You can tell me you know, exactly what strategy you use. Like the elevator doors open, one seemed kind of crowded, it's COVID, I didn't want to get into it. Or you can say, hey, I wanted to get into the crowded one because what if the empty one, like a New York subway car that's empty was kind of smelly. Um, so, you know, you could tell me the strategy. So it removes a lot of the guesswork. But uh, it wouldn't necessarily the tell you what part of the brain was functioning to make that decision. That you wouldn't. And in fact, what I've been learning slowly by looking into this literature more is it's pretty much a lot of it. Like, you know, even the smallest task lights up the whole thing. In different orders, different, different pieces of it light up in different orders to different extents. And they're correlated with different portions of the behavior differently. I mean, it's its whole field of literature. But I do think that, you know, my kind of uh, network models that only care about time series and give you this kind of connectivity and inter area principles could be used on the same kind of data. Um, they How could much, be, I just haven't done it yet. Yeah. How much data are we talking about? Like how, I mean, I assume Mount Sinai has a massive amount of servers. Do you use a lot of cloud computing for your lab? I do. I do. So I do a lot of my stuff on, um, on the cloud because I just didn't want to deal with the hassle of maintaining a cluster and things like that, but different labs do it differently. Mm -hmm. There is a push in the field to um, somewhat centralize this. So neuro data without borders comes to mind. The Spark program funded by the NIH, I'm a subject matter expert for the Spark program actually. What's and the they Spark come program? to mind. Uh, so they have, you know, these kinds of data repositories. Uh, Spark is, you know, body-wide. It's not just neuro, uh, but, you know, there's also neuroscience-specific um, data sets and algorithms that people are publishing. Neuro data without borders, as I mentioned, is another one. Uh, Sinai itself has a vast amount of human, um, human data from various kinds of, you know, adaptive and maladaptive um, scenarios. Um, I use the cloud mostly because I just didn't want to deal with the hardware portion of, of, of anything. That makes sense. Do you, you mentioned that we're not really limited by storing this data, but I mean, do you think that it will be true for the foreseeable future? So just right now we're chucking a lot of it, right? We're, yeah. We don't know, right? So like, you know, these um, electrodes are often, so in one of the experiments that people do, they put electrodes inside a person that has intractable epilepsy. So they want to figure out where the seizures are originated. So they put electrodes all over and this is done in the operating theater and they, you know, stimulate various electrodes and they try to pick up this activity. And then the patient is in the room with all of these electrodes 
you know, essentially waiting for seizure activity or something, right? But, you know, unless there's a, there's a motivation to keep all of these data, uh, people really haven't, you know, you need a reason to be able to store all of these longitudinal data. But let's say a theorist like me came along and said that, you know, a person that um, has epilepsy, you will basically pick up the markers of it like four days ahead of time. That very quickly tells somebody, okay, we need to probably keep a week's worth of data. Uh, and so we should just keep weeks worth of rolling data. But yes, as compute and storage become cheaper and cheaper, it has become easier to, to do these things. Oh, much easier. Even from the time that I was a postdoc to now, it's gotten easier. So I wanted to ask, you've been obviously really successful in your career so far, and I'm curious, you know, if you were always interested in pursuing a career in academia and kind of how that came about. Um, but I'm also interested in what your measure of success is for yourself. They're both good questions. Um, did I always see myself as, a, as an academic? Um, I think that that's probably true. Um, I don't think I got welded into this track until like grad school. And I wish I'd kind of kept it much more open because there were so many options. And there's, you know, e even to do neuroscience, there are so many options that are not in the academy um, that we're really doing a disservice, not telling more people about what those options are and how to break into them um, collectively. And we should, because, you know, there's, there's many ways of getting this kind of intellectual satisfaction. Um, so that's sort of one piece of it. The other piece of it is, what was it? Yeah, so I guess I'm curious, you know, you've, you've won numerous awards, you're running your own lab, um, but is there, is, there some, is there an individual way that you measure your success? Like, are there particular highlights from, you know, the last few years for you that you, you know, made your day or um, breakthroughs, things like that. <laughs> oh, well, well, first, thank you for the for the kind words. I uh, yes, I have been I've been fortunate in, in many ways. Um, I, I'm still trying to figure out, you know, how to do um, how to be a mentor and, and a scientist. But to me, above the like the fancy papers and the awards and like that, um, I think I've, it, this is like the, the, the first time in my, in my career, right? Like being a PI, being a tenure track faculty person, that's when it suddenly becomes not about you anymore, right? Then it becomes the metric of my success is measured by how successful in, in some local units, how successful my people that I'm responsible for are. Um, and, you know, I have, Sometimes I have a problem with the word trainees, but just for argument's sake, let's say everyone that I work alongside in my lab, their success is now then my success. That to me was the was the the, the big kind of change here, and I'm still like feeling my way around how to do that properly. Um, but yeah, it's that it's that suddenly you're doing the in a, in a weird way of parenting thing. Absolutely. Right. You're doing the thing where you're like, um, you know, resisting the urge to say, here, give me that. I'll do it. Um, you know, sort of, you know, letting them go on their way, breaking a bottle on their noses and saying, OK, you sail away with this thing that you want to do. <laughs> um, but then do it well, please, because then your success is really my success also. Sure. So, yeah, I think that to me is really the um, and, and that and, and honestly, that's the most satisfying. Mm -hmm. So like if a graduate student gets the notice of award for a, for a federal grant or a, or a postdoc gets, you know, they apply for a job and then they get the job and then you're like, this, is, this has been your dream or somebody in the lab starts a family or something, right? Or they discover that, oh, you know, maybe they didn't want to do this whole academic thing. They want to go do this other thing that will bring them joy. Those are the things that kind of make me happy now these days. I mean, sense. that's not to say that I don't like the shiny. Please give me some more shiny. <laughs> more shiny. <laughs> I like that. Um, are there any particular projects going on in your lab right now that you're you're excited about? Oh, very much. Like I told you, this curriculum learning idea is the is the one that's kind of noodling around um, baseline in my head kind of all the time. Mm -hmm. 
um, like a while ago when I was doing this multi-region, so I built uh, different kinds of models, right? So one deals with why are there even different brain regions? So for example, why is there modularity in the brain? Did it emerge during evolution as a consequence of the complexity of the things that we needed to do? Um, and if so, then how are brain regions communicating with one another? Um, are they cooperating? Are they competing? Or does that also depend on what they're doing? So that's what started one research program. And then it led into this direction with the learned helplessness and that kind of thing. Then there's the other piece that deals more with behavior. And that's the piece with, um, with how do we do multiple things, right? I mean, are we doing multiple things um, on the basis of doing all of them slightly imperfectly? Um, is there a capacity to how many of those things we can do? Um, and how are multiple things packed into the brain? So for example, if I learned to solve the elevator problem, am I now able to do any problem that smells a lot like the elevator problem, like multiple closet doors open? Or am I in the shopping, um, in, if I'm doing shopping, right, in, at Walmart or something? And are all the aisles kind of an abstracted version of the same elevator problem? Um, it could be that that may be how we're packing multiple tasks together. So that's uh, the second thought. And then the third one that I'm really excited about is this curriculum learning idea, which is how did we actually acquire the ability to do these things? Like what shaped us? Um, and by us, I don't mean just us. I mean, how are animals being shaped? And how do you discover the biological plasticity mechanisms or learning rules by which either a single complex task or multiple tasks, simple or complex, um, come out? And do we stack them sequentially or are we just kind of learning all kinds of problems simultaneously? These are sort of the, the, the questions, um, the big questions in the lab. And within each, there are you know, obviously like some projects. Do you have any pet theories about the brain that you know, you're kind of aware that you might never have the data to properly examine? I, like I'm thinking of this, book called Proust was a neuroscience mm -hmm. scientist and it, it goes into this idea that you know artists and writers and other people who weren't necessarily trained in neuroscience were able to make observations about like you know the CNS or or, mm -hmm. or the brain um and I, you know while I'm not on board with everything in there I think it's an interesting concept as scientists that we might have our own, you know, other theories going on that's kind of outside of the data. I have a concrete answer to this, but I do want to speak to this artist philosopher angle also. Um, I do think that artists and philosophers have seen farther than scientists can or have in the past. I do think that they're not, you know, they're not necessarily limited to the, oh, what I cannot measure or what I cannot create and the whatever, right? They're, they can really let their minds fly. And, and then they often do see farther, right? You know, like the, you know, if you're sitting next to somebody on the train and they ask you something about, you know, how do we dream or what's consciousness, they would get a better answer from artists or philosophers than they would from me. Um, so they do see farther because they're not limited by, um, by measurement. That's not to say that measurement or, that, uh, or, or hard science is not, you know, the actual fact, but in some sense, they do guide our intuition, right? They tell you, oh, that way lies. No one says consciousness is an unimportant problem, mind you, even though we can't measure it or whatever. Everyone says it's a very hard problem. And then I'm going to pretend it doesn't exist and I'm going to look over here now. Right, and but then they see farther. So I do think that there's really actually value in, in uh, talking across disciplines for sure, whether or not convenient. Um, that said, I'm going to go in a completely different direction and tell you something that I wish we had lots of data for and I could verify, but I don't know if I'm gonna, you know, run out of time before we get to that piece, right? And and that's the piece about. Um, you know, the, there are physical connections in the biological brain, right? All of these neurons are physically connected to one another with other neurons through synapses. 
They're also connected, glia are somewhere in the picture, as are blood vessels. So the whole thing structurally is kind of a complex mess. So people in a new subfield called connectomics are actually looking at reconstructing the structure of this. So that's one side, right? And it's, it's, a, it's a huge field. People are doing it at multiple levels. The full connectome of the worm is known. Larval zebra fish is there. People have reconstructed the structural connectome, like the physical presence of every single synapse in a one millimeter cube of the mouse. Recently, there was a paper, um, they did this with a very small piece of the human brain, for example. I do think that the field is going where more and more of these structural connectomes are gonna come out. So that's one side. The models I build allow me to infer what went into the duck, right? So I extract from my models that have been fit to data directly, something that looks like a connectome, right? It tells me which neuron is connected to which other neuron with what strength, with what directionality, and whether it's excitatory or inhibitory, and how big is it relative to the average, and so on and so forth. We're also working on a paper where we're incorporating glia into this whole picture. So I extract from my models some kind of effective, effectively a connectome of sorts, like a functional, dynamical, stable connectome. This has, I can tell you already, nothing to do with the structural connectome. I wish it did. It kind of, I'm pretty sure it doesn't, because models are wrong. <laughs> but why not that piece? So if I were to tell you this region of the brain projects to this other region and it's connected with this amazing mathematical motif, what do I need to do to my models so that they are either predictive of the structural connectome that's going to come out at some point in my lifetime, hopefully, or can I use the connectomics data that are already available for some nervous systems to build my models? But really, the former would be cooler because I can tell them where to look, right? I can say that, okay, you did this one millimeter cube in the mouse, great, but you know, if you looked in this other piece, my models will tell you that you should look in this other piece because it has a much better connection to the behavior. Like that cubic millimeter that you will reconstruct based on my models will do something. Like it will, you know, I don't know, quack like a duck. I, I've got this duck thing going today. <laughs> I, I don't know why. I but so you're talking other... about you're talking about something that you want, but that isn't necessarily like a pet theory, right? You're you're saying no. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What's my pet theory? Honestly, my pet theory is is the one that lets the biological brain do multiple things. So, um, you know, this, the, the, you know, one of the first few things you asked me was, you know, learning, remembering, and deciding, tell me one of those things, right? So then we talked about this model of working memory. So I told you how initially experimentalists were seeing these things called fixed points everywhere. Then a few years later, when behavior started to become more relaxed and people were recording activity while animals were doing things in a time varying manner, you could see these waves of activity instead. So you could see what are now known as neural sequences, and they're in different parts of the brain. Now, in behaviors that are even more complex, both of these things are replaced by higher dimensional dynamics. Not fixed points, not sequences, but something higher dimensional. So what if the reason we're seeing these stereotypical patterns of activity everywhere is because what these patterns are doing are merely tracking task engagements? So let's say I wanted to do multiple tasks, right? Something in the brain has to be able to track which task is currently occurring and when it's time to switch. So whoever in the brain is the state tracker has to have steady representation during the performance of a task and has to be able to switch at switch points. Two things that I just told you about, fixed points and sequences have this property. First of all, they're seen everywhere in regions that have nothing to do with one another, in behavioral contexts that have nothing to do with one another. Incidentally, they're seen in learning, remembering, and deciding. 
So what if we've assigned them a role that they're not actually doing? We think that they're, they're responsible for these computations, but instead what they're doing are tracking task engagements and switch points, which is why they're ubiquitous. And so of course there are lesion experiments where you can kill off these neurons that look like they're making sequences and then the animal fails to perform the task. But the animal could be failing to perform the task for a different reason entirely. So this theory of these stereotypical dynamical patterns being state trackers in the brain puts all of these divergent pieces of existing literature into one context. Like these animals are failing to do the task, not for the reasons you think they're failing. They're failing because they can't string component actions together. So now imagine a scenario in which, you know, we're, you know, we're, we'll go out for a glass of wine, right? I could take a sip of the glass of wine and I put it down. The action started, executed, and finished. Let's say the thing that made sequences when I was taking a sip and putting it down switched to becoming a different sequence or became a longer sequence or kept repeating in a loop. Then I keep drinking. You can imagine a pathological scenario in which it's not possible for these state trackers to track the switch points appropriately or keep a task going on for longer than needed, right? Like you don't know when a sentence ends or you need to repeat the same action a fixed number of times, like in obsessive compulsive behaviors. Like it's the same tracker going over and over and over and over again, as opposed to switching to a different tracker. So that's sort of my current favorite theory. Mm -hmm. that, that we're writing down and um, trying to find divergent pieces of um, experimental evidence to, uh, to validate with. I have a question. Please. So learning, memory, decision-making, how, how do you think about thinking or thoughts how like how does that fit into those three things and are we able to quantify just thinking poorly okay poorly so what we do so we know a lot more than we did before right so we know something that you know we know that we are capable of all of this internally generated activity in the brain you know, all of our thoughts and motivations and internal states and, you know, all of those things, right? And then there's the, the piece that comes from the outside. The two are not as cleanly divided as we would like. So the initial models of the brain were completely wrong, right? They treated, treated the brain like a light bulb, right? Like the switch is flicked on and something comes on, but if not, then there's nothing going on. But we know that that's not true already. It was a simple model, it worked for a while, it has nothing to do with reality. Reality is that the, the brain's more like a lava lamp, right? Like it, it's churning all of these patterns of activity, except there's also a switch that when it goes on, it makes less like a irregular lava lamp, but does something more that you want it to do. Like you're able to turn it on and off. So, um, so then, you know, in fact, my PhD thesis um, talked about how the brain might be able to switch between this kind of hallucinatory oblivion and externally driven or, or sensitivity to subtle external cues in, in an abstracted mathematical model. That said, we don't have any models that speak to the, the kinds of, I don't know, eloquently put question you asked, which is, you know, how, how does thinking fit into all of this? We do know that there's a lot of the same sorts of behaviors that are reflected internally. But without the animal telling you anything about the behavior or a behavioral readout, it's kind of guesswork. I have a follow-up question, and it's kind of a crazy question. Okay. Okay. Are, you're, you're probably familiar with some of the neuroscience research where you can take human iPSCs or stem cells and you can actually um, grow organoids in a dish. And some of these even have what looks like eye structures and, you know, different neuronal subtypes. And, you know, a lot of the material that um, is kind of basic to like brain tissue. That's right. 
do you think <laughs> that those organoids can have thoughts or like is that even i guess i'm just curious honestly it's a really good question i don't know um i don't know and at what level does that start i don't know that either i know that they're electrically active but they don't do any behavior but let's say you could design an organoid that did a behavior right like some kind of compound organoid that did behavior i mean i don't know right does that become conscious then right like it is feeling something it's responding to sensory stimuli but what it isn't doing is doing anything autonomously or in a goal driven way right mm -hmm. so i think a lot of people are comfortable drawing the line there is to say okay if it isn't doing anything goal directed then perhaps i feel okay with um with saying that it's not no one says it's inanimate either right it's it's living mean? tissue what do you um, mean by draw the line like draw oh to say like is is that conscious basically okay i see interesting like can it have thoughts and feelings and a sense of self and what what are your thoughts on con consciousness like that's a bruiser <laughs> i don't know it's a hard problem i'll tell you what i normally say honestly right it's a okay. hard problem it's way over there yeah. i'm going to focus on my tiny sliver please mm -hmm. <laughs> okay yeah no, no it's a hard problem we're not we're not ready to answer that one we, as a community and i'm speaking like broadly with them you mean we as in scientists are not ready yeah. to yeah. answer that that's right i mean it's a hard problem because because it's not as well constrained um we don't even actually exactly agree on the definition of such a thing mm -hmm. um is everything moving alive um sort of thing right like where do you draw the line exactly with your question with the organoids right it is electrically active you know it sustains itself and it does something internally generated uh but even in the absence of something overtly behavioral can we can we assign something like consciousness to it? We can assign aliveness to it mm -hmm. uh, because we can measure it. Um, yeah. But consciousness is a hard problem. Sure. Not at all dismissing it. In fact, I'm saying it's way over there. Okay, I have another crazy question um, that I was thinking about because I we have dogs and mm -hmm. um, and there's some research. I think it actually came out of UC Berkeley where um you know they do a lot of like behavioral psych psychology research with dogs there training like you mentioned um where you can um and i have my mic on so i can't grab it but you can uh basically train your dog to use these um speech buttons to communicate with you and so we have i ordered like the beta version or whatever and my dog can he will hit the button for like play. He doesn't do it as much for outside, but like, you know, that's his, he just like, he knows that I know. So he's like, I don't need to use the button. You know what I want. <laughs> um, but it got me thinking about language and I know we don't have a ton of time left, but um, it got me thinking about language and thought and how we as humans kind of expect language to be the way that we communicate and dogs obviously can build a vocabulary and learn words and that's fine and dandy but what about their thoughts like what form do their thoughts happen in or their feeling you know because they clearly have emotions experience anguish things like that mm -hmm. but what what does that look like you know <laughs> yeah so you know it's interesting you mentioned this thing right so we got this uh we got a device called clever pet and you know you can decide whether you want to you know trash this part of the response yeah no it's, it's not that <laughs> but so we have this um thing called clever pet yeah which is before the i think the version even before the, any of the talk um videos just came out right i mean th th those are amazing dogs clearly have theory of mind i don't know what people are talking about yeah, they have a theory of mind. They're capable of, you know, forming deep emotional bonds with people. 
they're most certainly conscious. They certainly have feelings, which they express. Um, so I'm not, uh, you know, a human exceptionalist snob by any <laughs> at all. I'm a very fiercely devoted dog mama myself. But we bought this thing called Clever Pet, and it's a reinforcement training device. Um, it's a treat dispensing one, right? So LEDs light up these pads, and the dog may, has to make contact either with the paw or its face or something with one of those light things. And if it does, then a little door opens and a treat pops out. Now these lights can light up in different orders. They can light up multiple at a time. And you watch these YouTube videos of dogs playing Bach on the thing. It's amazing. So we bought one of these things, right? And, you know, we set it outside and, you know, she accidentally made contact once with the thing, treat came out, then she kept trying, then she got frustrated. She tried to eat the thing. Uh, then she got frustrated some more, then she started barking, which she normally doesn't do, but she was getting upset and frustrated. She didn't get demotivated, she got frustrated. She got frustrated, then we got frustrated, we yelled and she yelled, I cried, he cried, the whole thing was a disaster. We put it away in a closet and then gave it away. But clearly, if we had left her alone in a room or a house with it, she would have found some kind of reinforcement way of repeatedly making contact until you know she hit it once and she got a treat. Then she knows, oh, I got to hit it there to get a treat. She kept learning and then hopefully playing back on it one day. But we never gave it enough time to do it. You know, they do. I'm just saying they do. We just don't know how to read it out because yeah. we're not very good. Right. But we're not very good at communicating. The question you have to ask yourself here is, they have trained us to be able to communicate and provide them everything they need, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, by now from your dog, like little faces that she makes or he makes, that what's happening to it and how they feel and then comfortable. Enough treat, more treat, there's gradations to it. So it isn't just a heuristic. Yeah. I, I don't think it is at any rate. Um, we just suck at it. But I think part of it, Sorry, I think one more thought and then no, I'll go talk. ahead. <laughs> I could talk about the dog the whole time. <laughs> and I, I do I wanna... think that we're impoverished in our understanding of intelligence in the animal kingdom because we are so visual. Mm -hmm. We have, um, you know, the models. That. But humans are visual creatures, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the early mathematical models, the, a lot of the early experiments. <coughs> sorry. They all involve the visual system. A lot of well-controlled stimulus studies, Hubel and Weasel, those experiments all came trying to understand the visual system. We're not that good at other senses. Um, and dogs are, you know, they rely on their olfactory senses a lot. And we don't know how to use that to communicate with them. We make, you know, kibble, basically. That's the extent of how much we have tried to communicate. And you can see this in like other, um, other animal species that we've kind of looked at from an evo devo perspective too. Sure. Interesting. Yeah. We just don't know how to read it up. That's the problem. Yeah, exactly. Huh. I wonder, but your, 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 uh, experimental data collection systems that you talked about, like with the zebrafish, is that, can we get to some of those things in dogs or? So people have done some physiology in dogs way before, like a lot of cardiovascular research use dogs. I don't know. So I don't do any experiments at all, right? Like I rely on my colleagues too. So I'm yeah. pretty sure experimentalists can speak to this much more um, intelligently than I can. I think people have. Um, so some of these tools don't work that well in different species. So the kinds of imaging that you can do, so the electrical activity can be measured directly by means of electrodes, or it can be measured indirectly by getting these neurons to express something that glows with a certain light, right? Calcium imaging, we call yeah. it. And so, so that kind of thing doesn't work as well when you look in deeper layers of the brain um, and in multiple species either. Mm -hmm. And so, and some of the tools to manipulate this activity causally that doesn't work very well in multiple species either. 
I see. Um, and you know, it's um, and it, there's there's a lot of ethical responsibility um, when when experimentalists pick an animal system to work with. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, most of it is driven by a deep need to understand some kind of cognitive function. Uh, so macaque researchers want to understand, you know, value-based decision-making and rewards and that kind of thing. Um, or to, to get at things that go awry in neuropsychiatric illnesses. Um, and so dogs may not be a terribly good model from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, you know, ethically icky, perhaps. Yeah. Sure. Interesting. Um, well, I want to wrap up. I know you probably have things to do. It's getting late there. Um, but I just, you know, if there's anything else that you want to touch on, um, that wraps up our interview with Dr. Kanika Rajan. I hope you learned a lot from this episode of Lady Scientist Podcast. Click subscribe to our YouTube channel or wherever you listen to podcasts. And thank you so much for listening.